Welcome back to the show, my fellow Strong Americans. With today's guest, we have Boris Blum. Boris has worked with successful entrepreneurs and ultra high net worth families for over 25 years. He's a sought out expert with deep insights into the unique challenges that these individuals face. He's not only known as the CEO Consigliere, but has also been involved in entrepreneurial ventures his whole life as a serial entrepreneur, turnaround expert, and investor. He has counseled many leaders on the insights and frameworks as an optimal performance coach to CEOs and their leadership teams. His extensive expertise into how high-performing teams execute has allowed him to create a unique approach called BOSS, which is short for Balanced Operating Systems and Solutions. Boris is also considered a business and financial expert who has extensive experience with personal and business issues as they relate to asset protection, business succession, tax mitigation, investments, insurance, real estate, estate, and business planning. He has directly owned and operated businesses related to retail, e-commerce, financial and banking-related services, real estate, and property management. He has overseen the complex operations of numerous family business structures involving trusts and family foundations. Boris is what I would call an extraordinary American, and I'm glad to have him on the show. Boris, are you there? I'm here, absolutely, and I appreciate you having me on. Boris, thank you so much for taking the time to do this podcast with us. I'm really, truly honored to have you on the show. Um, Boris, I know you're an you're a very successful entrepreneur and a high-performance business coach. Can you tell uh, me and the audience a little bit more about yourself, your background, and how you got started? Yeah, so um, I started my career in the financial services space, uh, primarily focused on working with business owners and entrepreneurs. Um, and it was focused primarily on their financial challenges, uh, as any other financial advisor might uh, in their career. But um, I early on uh, gravitated towards more complex uh, issues that clients were facing. And uh, the higher net worth clients face different challenges, as you can imagine, uh, than uh, the average Joe. So it caused me to start to focus on what those challenges were and how could I address them uh, as a financial professional. And I come to find out that there's a lot of challenges in trying to do that uh, due to regulatory requirements and things of that nature that um, kind of you know, handcuff people around what they can actually uh, do for clients. So uh, I got a little bit disenfranchised with the financial services business uh, and decided that uh, I might wanna look at other avenues of how to help my clients. And that led me to what I'm doing nowadays, which is uh, consulting with high-performing uh, CEOs of companies. So Boris, with regards to like your overall vision and goal regarding like uh, consulting people regarding high-performance business coaching, like how uh, what uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how that went through over the years and how you got to the point where you wanted to uh, consult and uh, show people how to do high-performance business coaching? Well, what ended up happening was I had, um, if you recall back in 2008-9, we had the uh, great financial uh, collapse or correction, uh, depending on who you were and how you experienced it. Uh, and I decided during that time that I wanted to move away from traditional fi financial services. And so I started working with companies that were in significant distress, basically on the verge of bankruptcy, and I became a turnaround expert. Um, and as I did that work, uh, I got to understand a lot of unique intricacies around um, how CEOs function, especially in times of crisis when things are chaotic and, and they're having a difficult time uh, managing their business. And um, it, it caused me to start to think about why were these individuals having the struggles that they were having? There, there must have been some kind of a common thread. And there's a number of things that I identified, but one of the things that um, was clear amongst all of them, is they were all striving for something I call peak performance. Everybody wanted to be the best that they could be. They were trying to get their teams to be peak performing at all times, but success wasn't there. For the most part, it was actually distracting their ability to focus on what they needed to do in their business. And I came to a conclusion that peak performance is not what you should be striving to do. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, athletics, right, you, you have the best basketball or football player in the world. Um, they are striving for peak performance. That's because they have a game to play and they need to win the game. And then when the game is over, they can go home. 
Uh, but when you're in business for yourself and, and you're leading a team of people, expecting everyone, including yourself, to be at peak performance 24 hours a day is kind of a, a, an unrealistic challenge. So uh, I started to coin the phrase of optimal performance. And optimal performance is different for every individual. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the CEO and maybe, uh, you know, his leadership team are functioning at the same level, uh, which is a longer conversation. But the point was that uh, I felt optimal performance was really what people should be striving for. And I uh, developed a couple uh, alternative methods of kind of working with individuals, coaching them through this. Um, and it seemed to work out well for them. So. So Boris, as a continuation of this uh, this thing, right? What was the biggest lesson you learned during your time uh, consulting CEOs and business owners about peak performance and optimal performance? Well, mostly it came down to the fact that the CEOs themselves were generally the the biggest problem in the situation. Uh, they had a team of people that were really. Uh, enthused about trying to solve problems within an organization. Um, they had a vision that they were striving to achieve some goals around, uh, but the CEO was creating a lot of chaos often uh, around how that was to be implemented. They had their own vision and idea, and it wasn't necessarily matching up to what their uh, employees or their team uh, were looking at. And so I decided that there has to be a better way to communicate and coordinate action within organizations. And that's what led me to develop this boss framework that uh, you mentioned earlier. Can you tell uh, me and the audience a little bit uh, briefly about what boss is about? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, boss is a framework of how to organize um, an organization around what matters most. Uh, and what I when I say matters most, matters most to the organization, not necessarily to each individual. Um, Every organization should have a compelling vision that everybody is aligned to. And that compelling vision drives um, how people interact with different departments, different individuals, with their customers and other stakeholders. Um, but oftentimes that compelling vision is just a statement on a wall. It is not in any way uh, a part of the culture and how people behave within the organization. And so it, it became evident to me that there had to be a better way to do that. Um, and BOSS was a outgrowth of that. It was uh, based on the fact that we could figure out what were the meaningful things that people should be working on, on a consistent basis to get to that compelling vision that the organization has. It's all built around the purpose of why the uh, organization exists in the first place. And that drives all of the activities. So everything that's being communicated through BOSS as a framework and everything that um, people engage in in terms of their activity is focused on that singular task of achieving the organizational goals. Um, and it's a, uh, a framework that I have not been able to find anywhere else. So I had to create it out of necessity. No, I mean, it definitely leads to results. So I, I know that it's a, it's a very innovative thing. And the way you're explaining it, it's all about like a lot of times like CEOs don't end up communicating with their employees. Uh, like they have a certain idea of like what they want, but then the rest of the team have like another idea, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, often, uh, I was just going to say that often that vision, not only does it not match, but the most important piece is how do you actually get people to engage in the journey to get to that vision, right? There has to be a prescriptive path of activities that need to happen within the organization to allow people to um, do their day-to-day -day work and know that they're meaningfully contributing to that ultimate vision. And oftentimes that's the missing piece is you can paint a picture, but you haven't explained how that picture is going to come to fruition. So, Boris, in addition to this, right, like you know, CEOs need certain successful character traits, like they need to think and act in a certain way that will also lead to success. Like, and, and from your perspective, what are the successful character traits that a CEO should have to make their company successful? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it comes down to three different things. Um, and I, I've always believed that there are three factors that make a successful CEO. It all comes down to leadership, but you can't lead people if you can't lead yourself, right? You have to have a way to um, focus your energy and activity around the things that truly matter to you and your organization. 
And every leader that I looked at had three distinctive things that um, was common amongst every single one in terms of their execution ability. It was, they were all decisive. They had no problem in making decisions. Uh, and a lot of times the decisions had to be made with little or no information um, that they could base it on. So they were comfortable in making decisions that were conscientious, but uh, without all the facts necessarily available to them. Uh, the second thing is they were able to take deliberate action. And when I say deliberate action is they had thought through all of the activities that need to occur. And um, they, they were able to take action on those activities. And the most important D that I would put in this, what I call 3D focus, is around discipline. They have extreme discipline in their day-to-day -day activities. They're very focused on what they need to accomplish. And they're able to help other people focus their energies around the things that they need to make you know, uh, their objectives successful. So uh, those are the three things. It's decisiveness, deliberate uh, action, and um, discipline. How, how like uh, are like all the like people that you have uh, consulted like how many people actually ended up having the three Ds like in percentage wise is it like a rare thing or is it more uh like with regards to successful CEOs like what percentage are you looking at that actually well, I think every high performing CEO that I've ever met has been successful at doing all three of those things that's how I came up with the three D focus uh, but I think what's important about it is that. It's, it's a learned activity. It's not necessarily innate. Anybody can have those three components in their life if they choose to. Um, they need to change probably part of their mentality if they're not currently uh, embracing those things. Uh, they need to understand a framework with how to implement that into their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but assuming that they have the right tool set and they have the right mindset, um, they're not going to have a problem, uh, you know, implementing this. This is not rocket science. Uh, unfortunately, just because it's easy uh, or just because it's simple doesn't make it easy, right? So, mm -hmm. No, uh, I can't agree more. Like, yeah, you have to be decisive. You have to have confidence in yourself and and you got to take action, right? And mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's pretty true. But on another note, Boris, as a continuation of this, right, I, what is the one roadblock that you, that you have seen in uh, in business owners across the board that you think is preventing them from attaining success? Um, well, there's a lot of roadblocks. Um, I think one of the things is the focus that they're missing. So uh, oftentimes they're so focused on their activity, they're working in their business, trying to solve problems. Um, and there's all these distractions in their life. Um, distractions that they get, not just within the organization, but at home and, and other places. And it causes them to feel uh, an extreme amount of stress. Um, all these distractions take away from their energy and their attention to the things that they should be focused on. They don't have a framework for managing what, what I consider as focus and energy, which is by far more important than managing time. Um, they're often very good um, at you know multitasking and managing their time and calendar, uh, but those things are not very impactful. Uh, if they want to make meaningful changes, they oftentimes have to focus their energy, and that's what they struggle doing because they don't have a good framework for doing it. Um, I came up with a couple tools that I felt were valuable in doing this. Uh, one is something I call the 3D focus management system. Uh, and it's not a time management system. It's a focus uh, focusing system. It allows you to understand what are the things that are most meaningful that you need to work on as an individual. And then you take those things and put them into action within the organization, within your life, uh, and make sure that other people are supporting you in, in those activities. And then there's uh, another component that I found that's called a productivity planner. Um, and it's not a day planner, as it might sound. What it is, is a way to track your day-to-day -day activities to make sure that they're in alignment with the objectives you're trying to reach. And so by incorporating 3D Focus and uh, the Productivity Planner, an individual can really raise their game as far as what they're uh, engaged in. Because at the end of the day, to get back to the discussion on distraction, it's what you say no to that's more important than what you say yes to. 
you know, there's a lot of things you could say yes to the, the what we call a shiny object syndrome. Like we all suffer from that on a day to day yeah. basis. Right. But it's what we say no to that makes all of the difference in our lives, uh, because oftentimes uh, there is only a handful of things that are going to make, uh, you know, big exponential um, results for us. And we need to understand what those things are and just focus uh, on those things and, and only those things in our lives. Boris, I don't think you realize like how uh, important, valuable, like what you just talked about is like, especially regarding boss and in the three Ds, because, you know, a lot, a lot of times, like we ask ourselves, what's the difference between the 1% and the 99%? And it comes down to these thoughts and actions and these, the free and more importantly, the framework in which the way they go about doing things. And it's these things that, that if done in a certain sequence leads to success. And if not done, it leads to failure. And mm -hmm. yeah, as, as you mentioned, it's simple. It's easy, mm -hmm. easier said than done, but like when you're doing it in actions to do it with the discipline necessary. And I don't think a lot of people have the discipline, but if they can develop that discipline, then that leads to massive success, you know? Yeah, success as a business owner to me comes down to really two very distinctive components. It's the ability to lead others and it's uh, making the right decisions, right? It's decision-making that uh, at the end of the day is going to uh, make or break an organization um, and its success. And if you've got a framework for making decisions and you've got the ability to lead others in, and engage them in the activities that you need to, um, you know, business success becomes pretty easy <laughs> uh, in that respect. Um, the problem is most people don't have that. And if you think about when, when you need to make a decision about something that you lack information on, right? You don't know all of the attributes that, that you would need and all the data points you would need to make a good decision. What do you do? Uh, human nature says you just make a prudent decision. And what a prudent decision means is it's a risk averse decision. I am going to not take chances because it's an important decision I know I have to make. So I'm not going to take a chance on making the wrong decision. I will cut back, um, you know, the scope of what I'm going to do, what, whatever that decision might be. But that is actually the wrong thing to do. Because if you think about in an entrepreneurial environment, it's about taking risks and understanding what is probable success and which risks you can and should take and which ones you should not. And this whole concept of prudent decisions gets in the way because it's a risk averse approach. It's a, um, you know, fixed mentality um, and it doesn't help you make progress. What you really are striving to do is make what I call conscientious decisions. Conscientious decisions are ones that you have uh, taken the time and effort to analyze appropriately. You've weighed the pros and cons and you know the probability for success. So you have confidence when you take action towards it. No, totally. Like it's all coming down to thought pro thought processes, right? And I wanted to ask you this, Boris. Like I know you've hum you have like been around a lot of high net worth families, and I wanted to ask, what is the thought process that uh, that people in high net uh, like high net worth individuals have versus somebody from like a middle class family or a middle class background? Um, there are probably two different things that stand out in my mind. Uh, one is this whole idea of long-term versus short-term. Um, you know, high net worth families generally think in the long-term. Uh, they have a, a clearer picture of what that looks like for themselves. Um, and, and it's not just as a family unit, but it's also for each uh, individual in the family. So the, the it comes down to what I would call a compelling purpose, uh, a purpose that each individual has passion around and they want to work towards. Um, what I find is middle class, I don't know if middle class is the right way to, to you know, label it, but uh, average people tend to spend most of their time focused on making a living instead of making a life. And high net worth people focus on making a life first, the living comes second. Now, somebody might say, well, that's easier to say if, you, if you've got a lot of money and you can afford to do that. Um, but I think if you look at it from a different lens, you'll find out maybe one of the reasons why they have money is because they're able to focus on what's important, not what's urgent in the moment. 
No, what what do you what do you what do you said is actually like really interesting because you mentioned that they have a vision for their life, like they're clear, they're they're very clear. It's clear clarification oriented, where they understand how their life is gonna be. Whereas most people, like you'd say, is that they they they're not having a vision for what their life is gonna be like, and they're just thinking in the short term. So mm -hmm. no, that's that's a very interesting take on it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um... and I, I'll. And like the, another thing that I noticed is that basically high net worth individuals, they pay as low taxes as possible. Whereas like most other people, they're like, uh, like they have to, uh, they have to end up paying taxes. So my question to you, Boris, is what is one tax mitigation strategy that the wealthy normally use that the, that uh, the middle class would be unaware of? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily a strategy. There are many different tax strategies and, and they're very much dependent on individual facts and circumstances. But I, I think what mostly is important here is the understanding of how wealthy people, as opposed to maybe uh, average folks, think about uh, assets and income. That is the impact on their taxes is going to be significant purely by the way they think about those two things. So average people focus on generating an income. And that, the reason why we have something called income tax is because it's designed to penalize individuals that are of more modest means because they're focused on income and the income is what drives those tax dollars. Now, wealthy people don't focus on income. What they focus on is on asset accumulation. And their tax rates are significantly different just off the get-go. Think about capital appreciation relative to income tax. Right on the surface, you can see a huge differential on how you're taxed. And um, when you work for yourself and you have your own company, as opposed to working for somebody on a W-2 basis, um, there's a huge differential on how you're going to be taxed. So the, the part of this comes down to mindset. It's understanding that you have a limited control when you're focused on income, but you have significant control when you're focused on asset accumulation. No, I mean, it's it's true, right? It's all about having like, it's all about as, asset accumulation. And like, that's how the wealthy think. Like they like a lot of wealthy people, they use strategic debt to accumulate assets. And a lot of people consider debt as a bad thing, but it's actually consumer debt that's bad. But if you're using debt as a means to accumulate assets, you can get wealthy relatively fast, right? And so Absolutely. It's, all, it's all about our mindset on how we look at the, these things. But mm -hmm. Boris, on a, on a different note, uh, you know, they say America is the land of the free and the place where dreams are made. Do you agree or disagree with that? Well, absolutely. I, I'm not aware of any other country in the world where people literally break down walls uh, in a variety of ways, physically and otherwise, to try to get into this country and, and uh, build a life for themselves. I think the American dream uh, still exists, uh, and it, it is unique and different than any other uh, place in the world. That being said, uh, I think there's a lot of cracks in the armor, or you know, however you want to put it. Uh, the last 20 years, maybe 30 years, have not been so positive uh, for the U.S. in terms of um, their positioning in the world. Uh, I don't think we've been headed down the right path for a long time, uh, and I don't see that that is in any way changed. I think we're still headed down the wrong path. Uh, that being said, I'm very optimistic that that will change. Uh, I think young people today are smart enough that they're going to figure out um, that they've been lied to, uh, over the years, and um, that this was, uh, this is not the way the real world works. And when that awakening happens, uh, I think we'll see a turnaround in the direction of where the U.S. Uh, heads and its leadership role in the world. So, Boris, what do you think is the biggest hurdle that Americans face when it comes to realizing the American dream, whatever it is for them, and how do you think they should go about overcoming it? Hmm. It's an interesting question. Um, I, I think, you know, most people, the average Joe, is struggling with something um, that is not their fault. They've been brainwashed 
for generations now to live in a world that's focused on competition and consumption. Competition meaning I need to keep up with the Joneses. Like my neighbor just bought a new Mercedes, so I need to buy a new Mercedes. You know, I it, it's that whole mentality of consumption and competition. I don't think that that's the way uh, the world looks like in the future. And I don't think that that is um, going to make a lot of sense to people in, in the economy that's coming in the future. I think the future looks more about collaboration and it it's more focused on um, what brings people uh, pleasure in life. It's the quality of life aspects. And consumerism is one of those things that I think um, actually drives you in the wrong direction. So um, I think the biggest hurdle for people is their frame of reference about how they live their life. If they can change to live their life within the means that they can afford to live their life and focus on things that are meaningful to create financial security for themselves and their family in the long term, uh, I think that the future is very bright. But if people keep buying into what they you know, hear on mass media or talking heads on social media mm -hmm. or wherever they're consuming this information and uh, they're not being critical about themselves and their actions on a day-to-day -day basis, they're going to struggle. It's going to be extremely hard, um, in my view, at least for the next uh, few generations if people don't change their mentality. No, I mean, it's it's right what you're saying. And I would like to actually add that, uh, you know, like over the last 40, 50 years, um, like the one of the things that Americans had to face as a hurdle is like they need to get more educated about finances and how the economy works, especially our inflation and debt. You know, like when I'm speaking of debt here, like consumer debt, because like, yeah, they had the keeping up with the Jones lifestyle. But what I didn't realize is that because of inflation, because we became a fiat currency, sometime in the 1970s that now there's inflation and the wages are not keeping up. And they, in order to keep up with the Jones, they had to take on a lot of mm -hmm. consumer debt. And mm -hmm. uh, like, which brings me to the next question, Boris, like, what do you think, uh, what are you, what is your opinion around inflation and debt and how should people go about dealing with that? Well, before I answer that question, let me opine a little bit about what you just said. Um, if you think about successful business owners and entrepreneurs, the most successful people that you know of, um, everyone that I've ever met that's been successful, for the most part, hasn't become successful because of their educational pursuits. Uh, I have plenty of educational pursuits that I've undertaken, and so uh, I'm speaking with somebody that has advanced degrees, but that is not um, necessarily the case when you look at people that are highly successful in their business uh, endeavors. And many of them, you know, uh, went to college, very prestigious universities, um, and they quit. They quit before they even graduated and turned out to be multi, multi-billionaire success stories. So um, I think education is one component that maybe is not as valuable as people have placed on it in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but when you talk to these successful entrepreneurs, you look at what are the things that have made them successful. One of the things is they have very good critical thinking skills and they have common sense. And I think that that is the key. If you're lacking in critical thinking skills and you don't have common sense, it is going to be extremely difficult for people to build a future for themselves going forward. Um, that being said, let me answer your question around inflation, debt, uh, and those kind of capacities. Sorry about that. Something just fell. Um, inflation for me is just a measure. It's a measuring stick, and it's not very good. Uh, not good in the context of um, you can't really measure it well. Like one person's or the Fed's uh, measuring of inflation is vastly different than somebody else's. So uh, inflation in of itself is just a measuring stick and it's not very useful. Um, debt is an altogether different problem. Um, debt, you have to think about in the context of 
leverage. Is the debt that you're experiencing valuable? Is it an investment ultimately into the future or is it an expense that is being frivolously wasted? Now, if we look at debt on a governmental basis as, an, as a country, uh, I think most people will agree that most of the debt we've experienced is frivolous and wasteful and, and didn't lead to anything and continues to grow. Um, the unfortunate part is most people are duplicating that in their own lives. Um, and I think you alluded to that earlier. They are accumulating debt, uh, but it's all consumer debt. It's debt that doesn't lead to any valuable outcomes. Uh, and then they're shackled by this burden of having to deal with the debt. I'm going to tell you, I've got this famous saying up on my wall that I keep from uh, a mentor and friend of mine. Um, he's a highly successful billionaire. Uh, some people may know him, Rick Rule. Um, and Rick has a saying, he says, when your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. Wow. And I think this is the core message that people are failing to not understand, right? If inflation hits you, what just happened? Your upkeep is going up. Now, if you don't have any debt, okay, you don't care. Like, uh, you don't care that much, right? I don't have that issue because I don't have a ton of debt that I have to worry about. You know, I don't worry about that my cost of capital is going to go up by 50% over the next 10 years if, if we're in a long-term inflationary cycle, okay? But if you are in that position, that's a really bad place to be because statistically speaking, you're not likely to increase income, you know, at that rate to keep up with that inflation. So um, people need to think about that in terms of their outgo, you know, what am I actually spending? What is a reasonable, sustainable way to live my life where I'm not stressed with this burden of debt, okay? And use debt for strategic purposes, like you mentioned earlier, that will help you acquire assets and will help you use those assets to generate long-term residual income that is not tied to your day-to-day -day working hours activity. I think that should be everybody's goal if they're trying to achieve financial security. Yeah, uh, I can't agree with, uh, I couldn't agree with you with more. And I would like to add like, um, we as a nation have become such a consumer oriented society, right? Like there's a, there's the consumers and there's like to produce, which, which is what entrepreneurs do. So a lot of our issues are coming from, as I mentioned earlier, like consumer debt and just like, things that are like liabilities and uh yeah if they utilize it to create wealth instead like as you say accumulating assets then that creates a change that creates a turnaround but like with regards to education i don't know like people uh, i would say that people have to have a mindset change on the way they view wealth and like that's what i meant by education because you have to have like a basic understanding like even the people that you're mentioning that were highly successful they had a what i would call them naturals they were like, they already had like some sort of like how to think and what to think. And a lot of people don't have that when it comes to entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, probably true. But uh, I think all of those things are learned traits. If, if you have the um, mentality of you're always learning and you want to uh, figure out how to do this, the information is out there. I mean, when I was growing up, life was quite different than it is today. Uh, I actually had to go to a library and search out information. Uh, I don't think anybody today even would know how to do that if you talk to a young person, right? You just go Google anything you want. We Google, just, just, YouTube, just right? Yeah. So, so information is uh, not expensive to acquire. In fact, it's free and abundant. Um and knowledge is, you know, kind of that next level is what you're talking about. And most individuals can gather the knowledge by simply modeling what success traits other people are doing. And because of the way that media works today, uh, and I don't mean the mainstream media, I mean, you know, the media that we're all mostly consuming, which is in the form of podcasts and YouTube videos and 
and all kinds of social platforms, um, you can gain knowledge pretty quickly. The problem is not the knowledge. The problem is wisdom. See, wisdom comes from experience. And that is what's hard for people to understand. And having information and knowledge is not sufficient to replicate success. You need the wisdom. And I think that that's what people should be striving for, is figuring out what outlets can I gain that wisdom that's going to make an impact in my life. Um, so that that's what I'm focused on trying to do each and every day for people today that I work with, is figure out how do I provide my wisdom to help them accomplish their goals in life. I mean, that's why that's why I'm so, I'm so grateful to have you on the show, Boris, because uh, we we could do with some of your wisdom, you know. And so, Boris, a um, uh, question I have: I know that uh, like, is there like a project that you're doing right now that you'd want the audience to get a glimpse into? Yeah, so we've been working on a project uh, with a neuroscientist friend of mine uh, that we we looked at this issue of taking action. And why do people struggle consistently to take action or the right actions? Um, and we also looked at it from the lens of the entrepreneur uh, standpoint and saying, there's got to be success principles, right? That most entrepreneurs face. How do we provide a way for people to model that? Um, so what we've done is we've figured out we're going to put together a, a six-week challenge. It's And it's basically... Uh, a challenge that allows people to interact with us uh, where we will present them what we believe are the success principles for entrepreneurs. And uh, we're doing this purely out of delivering value. There is no cost to, to this event. It's not like uh, we're trying to uh, make any money on it. Um, we want to give back. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a unique experience. Uh, we're starting it on uh, November the 17th. Uh, so I don't know when people will hear this message, but uh, if they hear it right around that time or slightly before, uh, they can go to uh, my website. It's Boris, B-O-R-I-S-B-L-U-M.com. So BorisBloom.com. And uh, they can register on there for the challenge event. It's free of charge. They can participate. And um, hopefully that will set them up for success. The goal here is based on the timing that we're doing this is that everybody that's participating is going to have the best 2024 that they can envision. And uh, that's what we're committed to doing. So uh, hopefully that's a value to people. And if they want to participate, we're glad to have them. I mean, Boris, that is awesome. And I would definitely recommend my audience to take a look into that, you know, because we all, we all want to know what it takes to be successful. And uh, so Boris, how can uh, our audience connect with you and get to know more about you this challenge and and the work that you're doing. Yeah, I, I don't have too many um, outlets that I support in terms of uh, connection. I, I am quite busy with uh, various projects, but uh, I would suggest, you know, obviously LinkedIn, uh, I have a profile on LinkedIn. And if somebody wants to send me a message, they could certainly reach me that way. Uh, they can also visit the website, borisbloom.com. Um, they can sign up for a newsletter that I publish called Perspectives. It is a, a private newsletter and it is focused on primarily an understanding of the global macro environment, finance, and what is going on in the world uh, as I see it, that's going to be impactful to the entrepreneur. Um, and that again is free of charge. They can sign up for that on my website. Um, and obviously they can connect with me there as well. Awesome, Boris. Uh, thank you so much, Boris, for taking the time to do this uh, podcast with us. Like, I am really grateful that you shared your knowledge and your wisdom and experience on what it takes to be successful and about peak performance. And I would definitely want you to come on the show at a at a later time. Absolutely. Anytime. I'd love to have uh, the opportunity to do that. And so I want to conclude this show by letting my fellow Extraordinary Americans know that, hey, look, there's an extraordinary within each and every one of us. It's our duty to awaken it and unleash it. Until next time, bye for now. Hey there, everyone.